I would like to announce that we grunt the old host again next year, so we have three years. <laughs> no, it's so good. It's so good after all those announcements and uh, having to shut down for uh, all the COVID things to actually be here together with you and to see all the friendly faces, familiar faces, some new faces. I see some young men in the back. In my mind, I'm still at that, that in that age group when we take you out on the basketball court, but then I remember. <laughs> no chance. Uh, but it's so good to be, be together tonight. We're looking forward to what God uh, is, is going to do as we gather together. I, I, I count a personal privilege that my pastor from high school and college is here speaking to us during these sessions. And uh, I honestly consider that such a blessing. And I'm going to tell you a real quick story, because you don't even know this yet, but our, our uh, youngest daughter got married June 2nd, this, just a month ago. June 2nd, five years ago, uh, our older daughter got married, and that, that also happened to be my wife's parents' 50th anniversary. And it was a, past, a, a pastor that I had done his wedding that was doing the wedding for my daughter. And my pastor, who had done our wedding, happened to be in Omaha that weekend and came to the wedding. So it was four generations of the spiritual heritage that was going on. And, and it was really cool, and we just think about that. And the other great thing is, I now have three wedding anniversaries on July, on June second. <laughs> God was making it easy, and I still screwed it up. <laughs> anyway, so glad that you are all here with us tonight. It's going to be a great evening. Just to to sing a song like that, only a holy God, uh, what just frames our evening together so well. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we are, uh, we come before you humbled and, and, and grateful. When we look at who we are and we really look at who you are, we recognize that uh, you are the only one who's holy and you are uh, beyond our imagination. And yet we're humbled to recognize that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us, to pay the penalty for our sins that we who were unworthy would be declared worthy. God, we're so grateful for, uh, for that gift of life. And as we gather here today, we, we uh, invite you to do your work in our lives, to uh, inspire us and encourage us to faithfulness, to uh, faithful service individually, and then as, as churches involved in the communities where you call us and where you place us, uh, God, to, to bring a, the light of uh, salvation and hope to those communities, I pray, Lord, that tonight your name would be glorified, that you would be honored, you would be lifted up, you would be exalted, and, Lord, that we would go from this place encouraged and transformed because of what we share together here tonight in heritage and history, but especially what we share together through your spirit and your presence in our lives, your presence here with us tonight. We're grateful for what you're going to do and ask for your blessing. Lord, we honor you tonight. In Jesus' name. Our Global Partners uh, has the privilege of recognizing our missionaries, our Global Partners, with many, many years of service. We call it an appreciation plaque, but uh, instead of a retirement plaque, because they are still busy and working hard and serving the Lord here at um, Grunfall Church. So, Ron... And Eunice Weeb has served faithfully for 42 years in various ministries. They were sent out by the Scrumfold Church beginning in 1981. Ron served as interim pastor at Hodgson Bible Church with uh, Pastor Bill Peters. In 1982 to 1987, he worked with Canadian Sunday School Mission now known as One Hope Canada, pastoring a church in Lavenham, in Manitoba, and serving as Sunday or summer camp uh, director. In 1988 to present, they joined Child Evangelism Fellowship, first serving as local director. And in 1993 to 2013, they transferred to work in Brazil, South America. And in 2013 to 2022, they returned to be director for CEF Atlantic Canada. And in 2023, they moved to CEF in Ontario and filled the position of Church Connection. 
during their time with CEF, they had a wide range of uh, positions from local director to provincial director, from teacher and trainer, from short term courses to national institute uh, instructor, pastor and camp director, and children's teacher to leadership training. A favorite verse is Jeremiah 33 3, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Their hobbies include bike riding, wood doing woodworking projects, visiting their kids and helping them in their projects, <coughs> playing with their grandkids and being fruitful in the kingdom of God every opportunity. Ron and Eunice are wanting to continue to serve God. There is no calling in life greater than the calling of God to the work of God, done in the will of God, by the power of God. We, have, uh, we are humbled to realize that God uses us in his plan for their lives of men. Presently, they attend Grunthal MD Church, their home church. Ron was adorned. Uh, adorned. Ordained? <laughs> That's like four years. Let's see, where am I? I run was ordained by FEC. Can't get that right. Um, has held position of elder, Sunday school teacher, pastor, missionary, missions committee, and deacon in their home church. On behalf of our fellowship, and commission on global partnership, we would like to thank the Weebs for their 42 years of faithful service to our Lord. So we have this nice plaque we'd like to present to them uh, in appreciation of a lifetime invested in faithful service for the Lord Jesus Christ, Ron and Eunice. Spirit, 
says the Lord. Her, uh, her home setting church, as I mentioned, Hodgson Bible Church, and she is uh, now attending Riverbend there at Dallas, and as I mentioned, uh, fully involved in the ministry there. So we are very pleased to honor Fran with this plaque as well.
willingness to obey all that you have for us. In Jesus' name. A good number of years ago, a couple of dear friends of mine from Omaha walked out of a restaurant where they just enjoyed a delightful meal for Valentine's Day. When they got out to their car, they noticed that on the ground and the pavement there was a hundred dollar bill. They picked it up. At first, Dell and Marcy thought it was a fake. But then when they looked at it closely, they realized it was genuine. So they went back into the restaurant to see if anybody had lost the money. And, we were there. and you know, at that moment, the temptation is to keep the money. But they knew they couldn't do that. It didn't belong to them. So they then lost in a search to find the rightful owners. The owners of that money, Kyle and Judy Schnur, had also been at the restaurant that night. And they didn't realize they had lost the money until they got home. And they looked everywhere for it. They looked in the car, they looked in their coats, they looked in their pockets, they couldn't find it. So finally they returned back to the restaurant and they discovered that the money had indeed been found and that the people were looking for the rightful owners. So they then posted a sign there at the restaurant with their contact information. A couple days later, a friend of Del and Marcy's who owns a business in that area just happened to be in the restaurant. And he knew they were looking for the owners of the money and he saw the sign. So he then brought the two couples together, and when they met, their own marks were able to return that $100 bill to its rightful owners. Now when that happens, two questions immediately come to our minds. Two questions. First, will they reward us for what we have done? Will they give us a reward? Now, obviously, they'd be happy because the money had been returned. But will they reward us? You know, they don't have to. There's no law or rule that says they have to. So, will they reward us for what we have done? And then the second question is, if so, how will they reward us? How will they reward us? Will they give a handshake and thank you? Will they give us part of the money? Will they give us part of their estate? <laughs> How will they reward us? And friends, those are questions that we can and do ask as believers in Jesus Christ. Will Christ reward us for what we have done in our service to him. Will he choose to reward us? And if so, how will he reward us? And friends, those are not illegitimate questions. Those are legitimate questions because they're both asked and answered in the Bible. It was Peter who came and asked the first question of Jesus when he said in the end of Matthew 19, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And that's the question we ask as Christian leaders, pastors, missionaries. We've given up everything to follow. Will you reward us for what we have done? And Jesus goes on to answer that question in the next two verses. He says this, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes 
of Israel. And so first he talks about the unique reward that will be given to the 12 apostles, that they will have a role in the millennial kingdom, judging the 12 tribes. But then he goes on to broaden it out to everyone else. And he says, but everyone who have left houses or mothers or fathers or sisters or brothers for my name's sake shall receive many times as much. So Jesus says, oh yes, oh yes, I'll reward you. I will not forget what you have given up, what you have sacrificed in your service to me. I will remember that, and in that day, I will reward you many times over what you have given up. Well, then the next question becomes, how will he reward us? How will Christ reward us? And we ask that question because we want it to seem fair. That is, as fallen human beings, we have this merit-based system hardwired into our psyche. We want it to seem right. We want it to seem just. We want to get what we think we deserve. And we want to see that others get what we think they deserve. So if Christ rewards us, how will he reward us? Well, to answer that, we're going to look at a fascinating parable of Jesus. It's found in Matthew chapter 20. It's a parable I call the parable of the eccentric employer. And this is a fascinating parable that has two scenes to it. First, in verses 1 through 7, you have the hiring of the workers. Then in scene 2, in verses 8 through 16, you have the paying of those workers. So first, the finding of the workers, then the funding of those workers. And what we're going to see tonight as we look at this is what God does may not always seem right to us. It may not always seem just. We're going to see. But we're also going to see that our God is a generous God. Oh, he's abundantly generous. And therefore we're going to see at the end that we will always get much more than what we deserve. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 and this parable that's found in uh, the first 16 verses of that chapter. Now before I actually read the story, I want you to notice something structural in the text. And that is, there are bookend statements to this particular parable. That is, if you look at the last verse of chapter 19, that is verse 30, Jesus says, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. But then if you look at the last verse of the parable, which is Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, he goes on to say, so the last shall be first and the first last. So you have these bookend statements that bracket this parable. And then in between, you have the story itself. And it begins like this in verse 1. But the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. So it's harvest time. And it means that he has to quickly get the grapes out of the vineyard. <laughs> he needs to strike when the iron is hot. He needs to, you know, harvest when the grapes are ready. That means this vineyard owner needs some more laborers. He probably already had some that worked in his harvest field, but he needed more. It's harvest time. So it says here that in verse 1, he went early in the morning to hire laborers. Now the typical Jewish workday lasted 12 hours. 
We start at sunrise, approximately 6 o'clock in the morning, and then conclude at sunset, approximately 6 o'clock in the evening. So it says that this vineyard owner went early in the morning, probably right at 6 o'clock in the morning, to hire laborers. And this would be people who did this for their livelihood. They didn't have permanent employment. They were just day laborers. So they would come to the marketplace every morning, see if anybody would hire them for that day. If they did, they would hire them. If not, they wouldn't. And they would start that process all over the next day. Well, on this particular day, the vineyard owner is hiring workers. So he hires these workers and they agree on a wage. It says here that he agreed with them to pay them a denarius for the day. And that would be just a typical wage for a laborer. It was the typical wage for a Roman soldier each day. It was a typical wage for a laborer each day. And they agreed to this. They we would pay them a denarius for their work. Normal pay for normal work. They agree to that, and they go into his vineyard. Now, what makes this story exciting so interesting is that the number of workers continues to increase as the day goes on. That is, he hires some right away in the morning but then either because he realizes he has much more work to do or he doesn't have enough workers, he comes back at different intervals throughout the day to hire even more workers. It says this in verse 3. And he went out about the third hour. And he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. And again, he went about at the sixth hour and the ninth hour. And he did the same thing. So the, the vineyard owner comes back to the marketplace at the third hour. This is now nine o'clock in the morning. The day is one quarter over. He finds there are some workers standing idle. He hires them to go into his vineyard. Now, obviously, he wouldn't work the entire day. And so it says, he will pay them whatever is right. In other words, no specific dollar amount is mentioned here. He just says, I will do for you what is right. That'd be like me telling you, you know, come over to my house and help me with this big project that I'm working on, and I'll take care of you. Yeah, no specific amount is mentioned there. It's just, you trust me to do what is right. Same thing here. He says, I will give you what is right. They agree to that, and they go into his vineyard. Then he comes back at the sixth hour. It's now half over in the day. It's 12 o'clock noon. He finds there are some workers who are standing idle. He hires them to go into his vineyard. Then he comes back at the ninth hour. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The day is three quarters over. But he finds some more workers that are standing idle. He hires them to go into his vineyard. I'll stop there for a moment. When I said this was the parable of the eccentric employer, I meant it. Because this is not an efficient labor plan. <laughs> If you're trying to get your harvest out of the field as quickly as possible, it'd be far better to hire one person to work the entire day than several people to just work part of the day. You don't have to train them, you don't have to manage them. I mean, so this is really an inefficient labor plan. But then it gets even worse. Because he does the same thing at the 11th hour. It says in verse 6, And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said, Because no one hired us. He said to them, 
you go into the vineyard too. So it's now five o'clock in the evening. Nobody's looking for work anymore. They're just trying to figure out how maybe they can find work the following day. But he goes back and he sees these men standing idle and he says, why are you standing idle? In other words, are you lazy? They say, no, that's because nobody's hired us. He says, well, I will. Go into my vineyard. You know, I'm with a surprised look on their face. They go, knowing they're only going to work about an hour. Now notice, outside of that very first group that was hired, no one else knows exactly what they're going to get paid. He just says, I will give you what is right. They agree to that, and they go into his vineyard. And so by the end of the day, there are far more workers in the harvest field than there were at the beginning. Now I want to stop there because I know we can see the parallels to the church. That as church history continues to march along, just like this day progresses, more and more workers have gone into the harvest field. Church began in Jerusalem. It then spread to Asia Minor. It then spread to North Africa. It then spread to Western Europe. Then spread to North America. And now, as you know, there is virtually a church in every country of the world. And as a result, more and more workers are now entering into the harvest. Not just from North America or Western Europe anymore, but from South America, from Africa, and from Asia. And consequently, there are more workers entering into the harvest field as the days grow short before our master returns. Now the question is, how is God Christ going to reward each one of them? Some of these people groups have been involved in the harvest field since the very beginning of the church. Others, like those of us in North America, we have come along much later. So how is Christ going to reward each one? We're going to see the answer to that as we go to the second scene in this story. And this, this is really where it gets interesting. In scene one, we saw the hiring of the workers. Now scene two, we, saw the, we see the pain of the workers. It says this in verse 8. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. So it's quitting time. It's time for all the workers to get paid. So they all line up to get their wages for that day. And he instructs the foreman to line them up in reverse order so that those who would be paid first were those who were hired last, and that those who were paid last are those who were hired first. Now remember, no one outside of this first group that was hired knows exactly what they're going to get paid. All the owner said is, I will give you what is right. And what they probably assume is right is that they would get a portion of a denarius for the portion of the day that they had worked. So maybe if they worked half a day, they would expect to get half a denarius. If they worked a quarter of the day, they might expect to get a quarter of a denarius. But the fact is nobody knows for sure what they're going to get paid. So we're all watching with anticipation as the first group gets paid. And it says this in verse 10, not verse 9. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, 
Each one received a denarius. Catch that. A denarius. They worked one hour and they got paid as if they worked the entire day. So they got paid 12 times the normal rate. Now I'm from the Houston area. I don't know what the minimum wage is. Let's say it's $15 an hour. I don't know what it is. But that means they worked one hour and they got paid $180. Not bad for an hour. Now, I'm sure that their mouths were just dropping as he put that denarius in their hand. Because all he said is, I will give you what is right. And what he determined was right is that they get paid as if they'd been there the entire day. So the master is being extremely generous. So while these people in the first group are rejoicing at the master's generosity, those in the last group are salivating. <laughs> because they see that. And they start doing the math in their head. And they're thinking they're going to get paid a whole lot more. Doesn't happen that way. Verse 10. And when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each one of them also received the denarius. Now we don't know what these in the middle groups were paid, the third, sixth, and ninth. We don't know for sure what they were paid. The text doesn't tell us. But I think the way the story flows, and they probably got paid just like those who were hired in the 11th hour, that they also got paid a denarius. And if so, then the master would have been extremely generous to them as well. But even though we don't know for sure what these in the middle group got paid, we do know what this in the last group got paid. One stinking denarius. So they all worked different amount of time and they all got paid the same. And he plops into their hand one lousy denarius. They look at that coin. Then they look at those who had only worked one hour and got paid the same. They look at the sweat on their brow and the dirt in their fingernails. And like rolling thunder, the grumbling begins. It says in verse 11, when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have only worked one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. What are they saying? This isn't fair. Instead of rejoicing and getting paid a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, they grumble, they cry, they complain. And apparently this wasn't a short-lived grumble either. The word that grumble means they continue to grumble, they continue to grumble. It probably only started with maybe a couple of them. But then before long, Auburn one in that first group were griping and complaining, they're saying, this isn't right. Those Johnny come lately's only worked one hour and you paid them the same as we who worked 12 hours. They worked in the cool of the day where you worked in the heat of the day. This isn't right. This isn't just. Where's my attorney? Where's my labor board? This isn't right. And then the master reminds them of their agreement. Verse 13. He said, but he answered and said to one of them, friend, I'm doing no wrong. 
did you not agree with me for a denarius? And notice he's not addressing the entire group here. Just one of them, maybe the spokesman or the leader of the group. He says to him, friend, which, by the way, is not a, a term of endearment. It's just a term that refers to a casual acquaintance. He says, friend, I've done you no wrong. You upheld your side of the bargain. You gave me 12 hours of work. I upheld my side of the bargain. I gave you a denarius. Isn't that what we agreed to? So where's the wrong? Where's the injustice? See, just because I'm generous to some doesn't mean I'm unjust to you. If I had not given you the denarius that I promised you, oh, then that would not have been fair. But I did what I said I would do. So where's the hurt? Where's the injustice? He says the problem here is not with injustice. The problem is with envy. It says in verse 14, take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? He says, take what is yours and go. I have done you no wrong. And if I wish to give to that first man the same as to you, that's my right because it's my money. And notice the verb there. Give, not pay. Which is what it would have been in a legal arrangement. This is not a legal arrangement, this is a grace relationship. Which means he can be generous to whom he wants to be generous. And just because he's generous to some, doesn't mean he has to be generous to all. That will be the way of law. This is the way of grace. And he can be generous to whom he wants to be generous. During my time at Moody, we held every year what is called Founders Week, which was attended by thousands of people and held at Historic Way Church in downtown Chicago. And during that week, there would be no classes, and a number of the students would work for us then as student ushers to just help with crowd control. Well, during one of my years while I was there, we had a student usher who worked one year for us named Rebecca. And Rebecca was doing her job that week with just grace and excellence. And before one of the sessions, a man came up to her and said, Rebecca, I see out in the foyer, foyer, <laughs> foyer, foyer, <laughs> that Israel, that uh, Moody is hosting a tour to Israel this summer. My wife and I would like to pay for you to go on the tour. She was stunned. What could she say? It's his money. He can do with it what he wants. And so we, she happily agreed to go, and she did indeed go with us to Israel that summer. But here's the point. Just because he had been generous to one Moody <coughs> student usher does not mean he had to be generous to all Moody student ushers. There were dozens of them, all doing their job with excellence. But none of them could point to this and say, well, that's not fair. Because if they say that, the problem is not fairness, but envy. Again, look at the last line of verse 15. Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Now, friends, God will not be capricious in how he is generous to us. He's not going to be generous on the whim. He has 
reasons and purposes for everything he does, even if we don't understand it. And know this, he will be generous. That's part of his character. But just because he's generous cannot make us jealous. Just because he's generous to one can't make us envious. Because he's God. He can do and give just as he pleases. So let's go back to the two questions I asked at the beginning. First question is, Will God reward us for our service to him? Will he choose to reward us for what we have done? And the answer to that is yes. Oh, yes. Jesus says, if you've given up anything in this life to serve me, if you've had to make sacrifice, you've given up family, home, father, mother, brother, if you've made those kind of sacrifices in this life, I will not forget. I will remember. And I will reward you many times over what you've given up. If that's so, then the question is, how will he reward us? How will he choose to reward us in that day? Answer, just as he pleases. Just as he pleases. Because he's sovereign. He does not have to answer to us. He's not accountable to us. He does not need to check in with us. And he can distribute his rewards just as he pleases. And it will be right. Now, he's not going to be stingy. He's not going to be miserly. He's a good and gracious God. But he is sovereign. And he will distribute his rewards as he pleases. And there will be no room for griping, rumbling, or complaining in that day. So here's the teaching of this parable. Continue to serve God faithfully in your area of ministry now. Continue to serve him faithfully now and leave the distribution of the rewards to him. Continue to serve him happily, faithfully, where you are for as long as he'd have you there and then happily receive whatever reward he gives to you on that day. Because friends, on that day, when the redeemed stand before our God, there will be some there who have served Christ their entire lives. There will be some who have served Him in great hardship and suffering and sacrifice. And they will be like those who were hired at the first hour in the morning. But then there'll be others. There'll be some who came to know Christ later in life. And so they only serve Christ maybe a portion or a fraction of their lives. And they'll be like those who were hired in the third, sixth, and the ninth hour. But then there'll still be others. There'll be some whose lives were cut short by martyrdom. There'll be some whose lives were shortened by poverty or war or sickness. There'll be some who will be like the thief on the cross. Believers for just a single day. Friends, the varieties of service around the throne on that day will be as endless as the billions of people who are around that throne. And how will Christ reward each one? Just as he pleases. And what he gives to you and what he gives to me 
will be right. It'll be perfect. And it'll be more than what we deserve. When Daryl and Marcy returned that $100 bill to the snoers, they didn't know if they'd get a reward. They soon found out. Later that week, they received in the mail a card. And in it was a gift certificate to the same restaurant they'd both been in. Perfect. And that's how it will be with us when he rewards us. It'll be right. It'll be perfect. There'll be more than what we deserve. Let's pray. Father, I think sometimes we identify with those who are hired in the first group. <laughs> grumbling, complaining. Failing to recognize you're the sovereign and ultra generous God. Thank you that you know our service, you know us, and you will reward your children. Oh, you will. You will not forget. And I pray, Father, that uh, on that day we will recognize what comes from your hand. And we will rejoice knowing that this is right, this is good. Thank you, our God, for loving us, for being generous to us beyond what we could ever deserve. It's such a privilege to serve you. Thank you for that. We bring that in Jesus' name.